So we're going to continue looking at linear approximation tangent planes and the differential, but now we want to go into a little more depth, um, give at least one result which will look kind of trivial, but is important that tells you in what sense linear approximation is a reasonable approximation. And then I want to look at a couple of harder problems involving tangent planes. And then I want to talk about some differential approximation problems, and, but before that, um, introduce how the differential is frequently written. Um, it's, uh, okay, so um, first it, I, I want to give this more precise thing about, um, this more precise result about how linear approximation works. This is not something we will use, it's just kind of more of a justification of why we use linear approximation. So suppose you have a, a function f of some number of variables, and assume f is differentiable at p. Then linear approximation, uh, or at least one way that we've written linear approximation, is that if, so linear approximation, if the vector h is close to zero, so it is close to the zero vector, then f of p plus h is approximately equal to f of p plus the total derivative of f at p evaluated at the vector h. So this is one form of differential approximation for us, um, okay, we've got this approximately equal sign here, and in what sense are these approximately equal? After all, if f is just continuous at p, then when h is close to zero, this is close to just f of p because of continuity. This is approximately f of p, and certainly if h is close to zero dp, f of h is close to zero because we know this is just the gradient vector of f dotted with h, and as h approaches zero, that would approach zero. So of course as h approaches zero, these sides both approach f of p. The question is, is the approximation saying something better than that? Um, yes, um, it is, and it, it's just kind of almost silly how you show this, and yet it's, it's kind of important. So you define a new function. So define, I'm going to write a strange script E, a thing of error. That's why I'm writing E, but it doesn't matter what you think. Define E of H to be F of P plus H minus F of P minus the total derivative of F at H all divided by the norm of h, so the, the magnitude of h, if h is unequal to zero, so that that denominator is not zero, if we're dividing by it, we don't want that to be zero, and we define it to be zero if h is zero. All right, so here's this, this function e, or script e, I can't pronounce it differently. Um, it's defined for all h's, or at least for all h's, oops, for all h's where f of p plus h is defined. And the question is, why would we look at this? And what's the answer? Well, by definition, if, if f is differentiable at p, this limit, as h approaches zero, the limit of this as h approaches zero, is zero. So, by definition, 
of f being differentiable at p the limit as h approaches 0 or the magnitude of h approaches 0 uh, those are the same limit saying that h the vector h approaches the zero vector and saying that the magnitude of h approaches the number zero the same statements the limit of e of h is zero because it's exactly what it means for it to be differentiable um, and what the total derivative is that if you put magnitude signs so absolute value signs around that numerator that limit approaches zero but that means this approaches the zero um, Sorry, that means this approach, this quantity approaches zero. So, okay, well, and when h is the zero vector, um, we've defined e of h to be zero, so maybe I will put the limit as h approaches. Um, and what does that mean? That means, so e of h is continuous, it equals its limit, is continuous at h equals 0 and equals 0 and e of the 0 vector is 0. And what's the big deal? The big deal is, well you can just look at it, it's rigged. It's rigged so that f of p plus h equals f of p plus the total derivative of f p evaluated h plus the magnitude of h times e of h. Right? It's just rigged to make this true if you subtract these two terms from both sides and divide by magnitude of h, you get exactly the definition of e of h um, for h unequal to 0. And certainly when h is 0, this is f of p, that's f of p, this is 0, and that's 0. So, so this equality is true for all h. And this is what we were headed for. And you might go, of what use is that? The point is that, yes, as h approaches 0, this part approaches this part, but how fast does it do it? And you might think, well, it does it just because the norm of h is approaching 0. But as h goes to 0, this part approaches 0 because the norm of h is approaching 0. But this is a continuous function whose value, at, it's continuous at 0, and as h approaches 0, this approaches 0. So the point is that how good is the approximation of this is approximately equal to these two terms. You might think it's just a matter of h being close to 0, but this part goes to 0 and that part goes to 0. So it's like there's a, a squared effect there of two different things approaching 0. In particular, this term approaches 0 faster than just the norm of h, um, the magnitude of h. If you divide this error part by the magnitude of h, you still get something that approaches 0. All right, that's just, this is just a nice form for theoretical results, and it does kind of make it clear that, oh, um, this approximation um, is good up to something that goes to zero faster than h. All right, I think I've beaten that into the ground enough. Now what I'd like to do is actually look at uh, just a couple of examples of tangent planes and tangent sets that are more complicated than what we've already looked at. Um, <coughs> so let me look at Let's look at the following problem. Example Determine all of the points 
at which the tangent plane to the graph of z equals 5x over x squared plus y squared plus 1, at which the tangent plane to the graph is horizontal. All right, so of course you have to know what equations for horizontal planes look like. A horizontal plane just means you're parallel to the xy plane. You have to have a fixed z coordinate. So <clears throat> uh, this is where where an equation for the tangent plane is just z equals some constant. That's what equations for horizontal planes look like, but we know that an equation for the, for the tangent plane looks like, well, um, z equals f at the, some xy pair plus the partial derivative of f with respect to x at that xy coordinate times x minus a plus the partial derivative f with respect to y at that point times y minus b. So <clears throat> we know the tangent plane is given by an equation that looks like this. Right, this is the general form for, or form for the tangent plane to the graph of this at any point, at any xy pair a, b, and then the z coordinate would be, you, know, you plug a, b into that. To get something of the form z is just a constant, you have to not have this x in the answer, and you have to not have that y in the answer. It means that this coefficient needs to be 0, and this coefficient needs to be 0. We need, so to get something like that from something like this, we need, we must have, the partial derivative with respect to x at the point and the partial derivative with respect to y at the point. We have to have both of those equal to zero. And so what you do is you take the partial derivative of f with respect to x, take the partial derivative, uh, there's no f, take the partial derivative of z with respect to x, take the partial derivative of z with respect to y, so this is it's playing the role of f of xy, Take the partial derivative with respect to y, set them both equal to zero, and solve simultaneously. And that will give you the, the x and y coordinates of the points you're after, and if you want the z coordinate, which really you should have um, the points at which the tangent plane, those should be points in space. So you plug those x and y pairs back into the original function and get the z coordinate. So that's what we do. So you take z equals 5x over x squared plus y squared plus 1. And when we take the partial derivative with respect to y, it would be nicer to have this written like this, but it doesn't really matter. Then the partial derivative with respect to x, all right, I'm going to use the quotient rule. It is the bottom 
Actually, but I might just pull. I should have pulled out the five in the first place, which won't affect. Five won't affect where things are equal to zero, so I might as well pull that out. Um, so now let's do the bottom times the derivative of the top with respect to x. That's just one minus the top. We've already pulled out the five. The x times the derivative of the bottom with respect to x. So that's two x all over the bottom squared. So you get five times, and then you have an x squared and a minus two x squared. So you get a minus x squared, and then plus y squared, plus one, all divided by x squared plus y squared plus one squared. And the partial derivative of z with respect to y, whether you do the quotient rule again or whether you write things in this form first, um, you get, here's the 5x, which is just a constant as far as y is concerned. Then you would, you would use the power rule, so minus 1, you get a minus 1, times x squared plus y squared plus 1 to the minus 2. But then you have to multiply times the derivative of the inside stuff with respect to y, so you pick up a times 2y. So what we end up with here is there's a 10 and then you've got xy uh, minus a uh, minus 10. So let's just go ahead and minus 10. A minus 10 um, times xy and then divided by x squared plus y squared plus 1 squared. So you get, you get this, um, and then we need to set both of these equal to 0 and solve simultaneously. So you set this equal to 0, and you set this equal to 0, and you solve. Now it looks a little complicated until you realize these denominators don't affect whether the fraction equals zero or not. And certainly the denominators are never zero, so the, the partial derivatives exist. For these two things to be zero, we need the numerators to be zero. We can ignore these non-zero constants out in front. We need, these will be simultaneously zero if and only if we need minus x squared plus y squared plus one equals zero and x times y equals 0. Now in general it could be hard to solve two equations that aren't linear in two unknowns, but this one's easy. This one says either x is 0, y is 0, and then you plug that in over here and see what the other variable has to be. So there are two cases. So there's case 1, x equals 0 over here. But if x equals 0, then over here you get y squared plus 1 equals 0. Well, that can't happen. We're in the real numbers, and y squared is greater than or equal to 0. And when you add 1, this is greater than or equal to 1. It's never 0. So this doesn't happen. But the y equals 0 case, right? from this equation, you get two cases. Either x is 0, y is 0. This was the x equals 0 case, and it can't happen. But then there's the y equals 0 case. And if y equals 0, you plug that in up here, you get minus x squared plus 1 equals 0. That's the same as x squared equals 1. And so x is plus or minus 1. So we found two xy pairs at which the tangent plane would be horizontal. Uh, 1, 0, and minus 1, 0. So uh, we get horizontal tangent plane abbreviating wildly. A horizontal tangent plane when xy equals 1, 0, and there's a horizontal tangent plane 
where x, y equals minus 1, 0. Um, the z coordinates would be nice to find those. The instructions seem to indicate we want them. So let's go ahead and just plug those in. When x is 1 and y is 0, you would get, all right, when x is 1, you get 5. And when y is 0 down here, you get a 2. So you get 5 halves, so the x, y, z point. 5 halves. So there's one point in space. Um, and then uh, minus 1, 0, all that does is negates the numerator. You get minus 5 up here, you square 1, you still get 2 down here. So you get x, y, z equals minus 1, minus 5 halves. And so those are the points where you have horizontal tangent planes. You can have some, we presumably you don't know what the graph of this looks like. Uh, you can have some graphing software draw it for you. I will attempt to <laughs> give some bad sketch of it. If here's the positive x, there's the negative x-axis, here's the positive y. Um, what you're seeing is both of these occur when y is 0, so in the xz plane. And so uh, the cross section where y is 0 of this thing roughly looks like, so you're supposed to picture this in the xz plane kind of in perspective, roughly looks like that, and you give it, then you give it some three-dimensionality. I'll give it, give it some of these and make it look like a, or give it some make it look like it's sitting in three dimensions. So give it the surface itself is two-dimensional. And then the, tan the horizontal tangent planes that you're seeing are here at that local maximum, which we'll talk about in a later section, and here at this local minimum. All right. That was fairly complicated, but not too bad. It's kind of a standard type of example find where graphs have horizontal tangent planes. And this is a skill that'll be important later um, because it's the same thing you do to find local maxima and minima. All right, let's look at <coughs> a higher dimensional tangent set. Um, it's, uh, you won't be able to picture this. I won't be able to picture it either. And we'll just use a lot of work that we did or when we looked at the same function and used it for linear approximation, once you've done that, describing the tangent set is easy. It's uh, picturing it, it would be <laughs> essentially impossible. So let's look at our old friend Z equals g of x1, x2, x3, x4. So this would be our x vector. Um, or maybe I should write you know, this way and underline to think of it as a point, not a vector. Um, and the function is x2 e to the x1 plus x3 times the cosine of 2 pi x. Um, and we've, you know, so let's describe the tangent set. to the graph of G. At the point, where X is so the same point we used when we found the linearization. 0, 1, minus 2, 1. Okay? 
Um, the scribble. I like that word, the scribble. Maybe though, describe would be better. Describe the tangent and set is left out. The tangent set to the graph of G at the point where um, X is 0, 1, minus 2, 1. Uh, this is what we would normally call P. Yes, it's a specific value of the X point, but let's call it P. Well, we looked at the linearization of this before. We found that the linearization of F at X, of, uh, sorry, of G at the point 0, 1, minus 2, 1, we did this already. And what we found was the linearization was minus 1 plus x1 plus x2 minus 1 plus x3 plus 2. So this is the linearization of g at the point 0, 1 minus 2, 1. Well, if you've got the linearization, the, the tangent set is the graph of the linearization. So remember that x, the reference to x4 dropped out because the coefficient in front of that part was zero, but you still, there's still an x4 kind of here, so maybe I'll write L of, it's just that the value of x4 doesn't play a role. So, um, but the tangent set is the graph of the linearization, and and so, what, what does that mean, the graph of the linearization? We can't picture it. The tangent set, it's the set, and it's what you do for functions of fewer variables. The tangent set is the set of points well, of the form well, x1, x2, x3, x4 get to be anything. But the z coordinate, or the next coordinate, right? the graph sits in one higher dimension. The graph of a function of two variables sits in three dimensions. The graph of a function of one variable sits inside two dimensions. The graph of a function of four variables sits in five, inside five dimensions. And the, the fifth coordinate is just the value of the function. So, at, so it's all the points of this form in R5, five-dimensional Euclidean space. What is that? Well, it is what it is. It's the set of all points of that form um, in five-dimensional Euclidean space. I realize that's unsatisfying. You can't picture it. That's the way it is with higher dimensional examples. You don't picture them. And then what you write may look a little trivial or unsatisfying, but that's what you get. All right, what I want to do now is, is talk about differential approximation more, but first I need to kind of um, talk about the notation for differential approximation or for the differential itself for a while, and then I want to do two examples. So we had differential approximation, and yet really I haven't called anything just the differential. I mean, you can call the total derivative the differential at a point, but I use them slightly differently. Some people don't. So let me remind you how linear approximation looks as differential approximation. Differential approximation was just that the change in f, so delta f, is approximately the differential of the function done to the change in the variables, so the change in the, the, the vector that you're applying the total derivative to when you start out at an x-coordinate that's near p. So that's how differential approximation looks. 
I want to I want to rewrite this side. So let me let me do that. Um, so we have the total derivative of f at p, and you evaluate it on some vector, which I think of as a velocity vector. So. And we know it's given by the gradient of f at p dotted with this vector. And that means exactly that this is given by the partial derivative of f with respect to the first variable evaluated at p <clears throat> times v1 plus the partial derivative of f with respect to the next variable evaluated at p times v2. And then you add all of these together times the partial plus the partial derivative of f with respect to xn evaluated at p times vn. I would like to rewrite this instead of having the reference to the individual v's here. I would like to have something that's a function done to the vector v so that I can then stop writing the v's on both the vector v on both sides of the equation. And you do this by recalling one of our examples. We had xi equals the i coordinate function. And this is usually just, if there won't be any confusion, this is usually just written as x sub i. It's the, you know, sometimes we use x sub i to denote um, an actual specific ith coordinate of a point, um, but really it's the function xi done to the point, it picks out the ith coordinate. In any case, there won't be confusion here. If we had the, the ith coordinate function, what we found is its differential, uh, its total derivative at any point done to the vector v just picks out the ith component of v the ith coordinate. Um, okay, so what? Well, that means here, where we had the v's, we can instead write, we can instead write, <laughs> this is going to make things look more complicated for a moment, but it should get better. We can write dp at x1 done to v plus the partial derivative of f with respect to x2 at p times dp at x2 evaluated at v, and so on. So I'm replacing all the components v1 through vn with something that looks more complicated right now, but I will fix it. All right, so you can write this. Fine. Okay, what do we do at this point? First of all, the, the total derivative of the ith coordinate function picks out the ith component of the velocity vector regardless of the point p that you're at. So essentially no one bothers writing the point p here because it doesn't affect what you get. So. Um, it would be very non-standard, or fairly non-standard, to reference a specific point P since it doesn't affect what the, the total derivative does. So for that reason, you could drop the P's on all of these differentials. But we're actually going to drop the P's everywhere. We know that, yeah, we evaluate all of these at P, and yeah, these should be the, these these total derivatives of the coordinate functions at p, but since everything's at p, we just remember that everything is done at p, and you don't write the p's on either side of the equation. You just write df equals, and then you erase all the references to p. So what you get is something that looks significantly simpler, just because you don't have all those p's floating around, but you remember
that it means that for each p you get the equation we have that you put in the p's on the partial derivatives and on these total derivatives of the coordinate functions. But, oops, see, I had trouble doing that. But at the same time, well, maybe I won't do that. Let me go ahead and write. I was going to do two simplifications at once, but I'll wait. So you get this, but now both sides are functions done to the vector v. And so as functions applied to v, you can erase the v on this side and erase the v's on the other side. And just remember, when you evaluate at a velocity vector v, you plug it into the functions on both sides. Of course, that's what you always do with functions. And so what people write is just df equals the partial derivative of f with respect to x1 times dx1 plus, and I didn't write the x2 in a minute ago, but maybe I could put them in as many as you want. This. Um, and, and if you want, you can write this in gradient notation, you could write, this is just the gradient vector of f dotted with d of the x vector. Sometimes that's convenient. But the point is, we have suppressed the reference to the point p. This is true, it, you use this equality at any point p, it just means if you put the p down there, that's where you evaluate the partial derivatives and you can put the p's on these total derivatives, but those usually aren't put there no matter what. And then you get a total derivative, which can then be evaluated on a velocity vector. And if you pick a velocity vector, you then plug it in to that dPf, and then into these, um, the d's of the, the total derivatives of the coordinate functions, um, you plug the v's in there. Right? So in, in the end, what happens is this would just become v1 after you plug in, after you evaluate both sides at v, this would become v1, and if you evaluate at v, this would become v2. Um, in this form, this is usually called the differential. And as you can see, it's kind of, it's essentially notation for a function that gives you the total derivative at a point after you pick the point. All right. So this is what I'll call the differential of f. And so, um, how does differential approximation go? Well, you just, you just calculate df, not at a point p at first, then you calculate, then you um, evaluate everything at some point p, then you will plug in, on both sides, you evaluate on the velocity vector, that's the small change in x vector. And what you'll get is the approximate change in f, but when you evaluate this side on the approximate change in x vector, you can think of it as each of these dxi's gets replaced by a small delta xi, right? Because when you, when you evaluate on an actual delta x vector, evaluate that, it just picks out the delta, you get delta x1 here. So it is not that this miraculously becomes delta x1, but in effect, that's that is what happens because you're evaluating both sides on the vector delta x and this picks out the delta x1 part. So if you want to think dx1 represents a small change in x1, well that's how it's used in differential approximation. It doesn't really. It represents the total derivative of the, uh, of the first coordinate function. But when you use it in differential approximation, this part just becomes delta x1 and this becomes a small delta x2. All right, so I'm trying, this is an explanation of the notation that you see all the time, this differential notation. It takes a while to say it, but it's easier to use than it is to say all that stuff. Um, so let's do an example. First of just using, well, yeah, let's do an example kind of using our notation and then doing 
differential approximation. <clears throat> So, an example, let, oh, a Greek letter, omega, if you want to think W, okay, but it's really an omega. Let omega of x, y, z equal e to the x squared y times the sine of pi z over 2. All right, so questions we'd like to... What is the differential d omega? What's the differential at the point 3, 2, 1 of omega? So, you know, this is the total derivative. We might still say differential, but the total derivative of omega at the point 3, 2, 1. And then let's evaluate that on some velocity vector. What's the total derivative of omega at 3, 2, 1? Evaluate it at the velocity vector, minus 2, 5, 7. What's this? And then, finally, if x, y, z is initially 3, 2, 1, and changes by delta x, y, z equals something small, namely minus 0 0.02, 0 0.05, and 0 0.07, approximate the change in omega. All right. So... This will use our kind of various, you know, the total derivative, the differential notation, evaluating at points, plugging in velocity vectors. And then here's differential approximation. By the way, it is not a coincidence that that change vector, the delta of x, y, z vector, is 100th of this. If you divide each of these components by 100, you get that change in. That'll mean that we can use our work here to help us with the approximation there, but we'll see that in a second. So, all right. What do you get? All right, we've got omega is e to the x squared y sine of pi z over 2. d omega, the differential of omega. You take the partial derivatives of omega with respect to each of its independent variables, and you just multiply by the corresponding differential of the variable. So, in other words, we take the partial of omega with respect to x times dx plus the partial derivative of omega with respect to y times dy plus the partial derivative of omega with respect to z dz. What do we get? All right, let's not mess this up. The partial derivative with respect to x, that's a constant. The derivative of e to the something, you get the e to the something back, but by the chain rule, you have to multiply times the derivative of the exponent with respect to x for this first part. When you take the derivative of that exponent, you'll get a 2xy. So you get a 2xy. And then, you, actually, I don't know why I'm writing this here. It's not going to fit there. <clears throat> so what do we get? We get a 2xy times e to the x squared y sine of pi z over 2 dx plus partial derivative with respect to y. We get the same thing we got here, except you have to take the partial derivative of the exponent with respect to y instead of x. So instead of a 2xy, you just get an x squared. So you get an x squared e to the x squared y sine of pi z over 2. That's times dy. And then finally, 
need to take the partial derivative with respect to z, well then this part's a constant as far as z is concerned, and you get an e to the x squared y. You get a the derivative of sine cosine. The inside stuff stays the same, but by the chain rule you have to multiply times the derivative of the inside stuff with respect to z, so you'll pick up a pi over 2, which I'll write out in the front, and then times a dz. So that's the differential of omega. All right, uh, I don't want to rewrite that, but to evaluate this at a point, so the second part of the problem was to evaluate this at 3, 2, 1. So once you have the differential, evaluating it, looking at the total derivative at 3, 2, 1, means evaluating each of these partial derivatives at 3, 2, 1. It does not mean doing anything with the differentials dx, dy, and dz. Those get used when you apply this to a velocity vector v. Before that, they just sit there. Um, we could put, remember how we derived our notation, we could subscript dx, dy, and dz and write d sub 3, 2, 1 here and d sub 3, 2, 1 and d sub 3, 2, 1, but the, the differentials of the coordinate functions don't change with the point, so that's not normal. But what you don't do, this is the big warning, do not plug in anything for dx. The 3, 2, 1 does not affect that. These will just go into the partial derivatives. So uh, let me just plug these in and not screw this up. When x is 3, y is 2. x is 3, y is 2, so this is 18. 9 times 2, so this is 18. Uh, z is 1, so you get that. Over here you get x squared, that's 9. This is still 18. Z is still 1, so you get sine of pi over 2. This is still 18, and you get the cosine of pi over 2. But the sine of pi over 2 is 1, 1. The cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So that part, so this is 1, this is 1, but this is 0. So the reference to dz drops out, and what we're getting is that the total derivative of omega at 3, 2, 1 is uh, 12 e to the 18th times dx plus 9 e to the 18th. Um, times dy. If you want, you can factor out a, a 3e to the 18 and get, uh, it's 3e to the 18 times 4dx plus 3dy. All right, so that's the total derivative at the point 3, 2, 1, or the, you can say the differential at the point 3, 2, 1. Um, if we now want to evaluate on a velocity vector, you, that's when you'll replace the, the dx, the dy, and if it were still there, the dz. Oops, I just erased the velocity vector that I cared about. So I'll put that back. Um, what's d, 3, 2, 1, of omega, evaluated at minus 2, Velocity vector minus 2, 5, 7. You want to know what this is? Well, what do you do? It means you evaluate, you plug in minus 2, 5, 7 for a velocity vector v. So over here, it means, oh, we had d, 3, 2, 1 of omega. And you evaluate this on the velocity vector, minus 2, 5, 7. That means you evaluate these differentials on the velocity vector, minus 2, 5, 7. But those, these differentials just pick out the, the corresponding components in the velocity vector. So if you plug in minus 2, 5, 7 in the x position, you have minus 2. 
So when you evaluate dx on that velocity vector, you just get minus 2. And when you evaluate dy on that velocity vector, it just picks out the y-coordinate. So you get times 5. Or what's the same thing over here? You get dx is minus 2. And dy is 5. So you get 15 minus 8. So you get 7 times 3. So you get 21 e to the 18th, which is huge. <laughs> Nonetheless, that's what we are getting. Um, 21 e to the 18th. That. OK, great. That's the total derivative, or the differential of omega, at 3, 2, 1, evaluated on the velocity vector, minus 2, 5, 7. What do you do for this? Well, this is just differential approximation, which says that the change in omega is approximately the differential at kind of the starting point for the x's, at 3, 2, 1, times uh, of omega <coughs> evaluated on the change on the change vector. <coughs> so the change in x, y, z. But that vector is one hundredth of this vector. So <coughs> uh, we're evaluating this on one hundredth of minus 2, 5, 7. Huh. But you can pull <coughs> this constant out of the derivative because the, the total derivative is linear. You can split up sums and pull out constants. It's linear in the uh, velocity vector. So you can just, you get 100 of total derivative at 3, 2, 1 of omega times, oh, this, this is very bad. I wrote equals up here. <clears throat> this is the differential approximation. That's approximately equal. Uh, one hundredth times the total derivative evaluated at minus 2, 5, 7, which we'd calculated before. So this is one hundredth so 100th of this, I might as well write 0 0.21 times e to the 18th. So this is what we get from differential approximation. Now the numbers are huge, um, so maybe the approximation isn't too good as far as in an absolute sense, but it might be good in relation to the actual value. It might be relatively small in relation to the actual value of omega itself at 3, 2, 1. Um, which is e to the 18th. Um, in fact, I'm going to talk about relative differentials now, but this is the answer to this problem. All right. So, yes, this number is huge, and you would <coughs> expect then that, yeah, we said, like, a, you think kind of a small change in x should correspond to a small change in your function. Well, this isn't small. On the other hand, it's small kind of in relation to the original value. If you plug in x, y, and z, 3, 2, and 1, you get e to the 18th times the sine of 1, uh, times the sine of pi over 2, which is 1. So you get e to the 18th. So if you look at the ratio of this change, this approximate change, divided by the original value, then you get 0.21, and that kind of seems small. Um, so we do look at this. The the relative change, the, the relative change in a function and we just mean the change in the function but divided by the actual value of the function. And if we're using differential approximation, we would say, oh, well, that should be approximately equal to df over f, right? Because delta f is approximately df. 
But what we mean by that is, yes, at a point P where the F values start and evaluated on a small change in X vector, so this is what you write. And this thing, DF over F, is usually referred to as the relative differential. And in a lot of physical applications, this is what you care about, the relative differential or the relative change in the function, not its actual, the actual change in it. Because if something starts out in the trillions, then changing by one isn't such a big change. On the other hand, if you start out with something that's about a half, then a change by one seems like a big change. So what's a, a typical problem? Let's just look at a kind of a standard application type problem. Um, the power loss. across a resistor um, is given by P equals I squared R, where P is the power. Loss is in um, watts, uh, I is in amps, and R is in ohms. So suppose you've got this, and then suppose, uh, suppose I move to a different board. Um, suppose, oh, well, let's do a part A. Part A, write the relative differential of P in terms of the relative differentials of I and R. And then B, um, if I increases by 10%, um, ah, I, I'm not sure I said what I and R are. I mean, the units might give them away. I'm sorry. I is, is the current through the resistor, and it's measured in amps, but you know, I is not amps. I is current measured in amps. And R is the resistance of the resistor, and that's measured in ohms. Um, if I increases by 10%, and R decreases by 5%, approximate the relative change. And the power loss. All right, there. All right. How difficult is this? Actually, this is a much easier problem than the one we just did. It may look worse because now there are all these word things, and, and it uses this new notion of relative differential, but it's actually much easier than the last problem. It certainly not, doesn't have as much stuff in it. So what do you do? 
you take p equals i squared r, so what's the differential of p? It's the partial derivative of p with respect to i times di plus the partial derivative of p with respect to r, dr. But you can just write those easily. This is the partial derivative of p with respect to i is 2ir. We still have this di. Then plus the partial derivative of p with respect to r, i squared times. And you still have this times dr. So that's the differential of p. We want the relative differentials. So you divide by p. So over here you divide by p. Over here you divide by p, but you put in what p is in terms of i and r. It's i squared over r. So you get this divided by i squared over r. Great. So what does this tell us? It tells us dp over p, dp over p is, right, if you divide this side, oh, if you divide this part by this, the r's cancel, um, one of the i's cancels, and you're left with 2 times, so the r cancel, one of the i's cancel, but you're left with di over i. Well, that's good, because that's the relative differential of i. So you just get 2 times di over i plus, and then you have i squared divided by i squared r, the i squareds cancel, and you're just left with dr over r. Well, this is the answer to part a, this. And it's kind of cool how, how simple this comes out to be. dp over p, the relative differential of p, is 2 times the relative differential of i plus the relative differential of r, which is very nice. And then what do we want? We want if i increases by 10%, so now we need to do part b. And it's if i increases by 10% and r increases decreases by 5%, approximate the relative change in p. Well, all you do is write delta p over p is approximately dp over p. And you're going to evaluate on the velocity vector that you're given, but what are you given? You're given that you're, you're given delta i over i, so the relative change in i, is 10 is 0 0.10, right? When you say that something changes by 10%, that means 10% of its original value. So saying that i goes up by 10% means delta i, if you put this i over there, that delta i is one-tenth of i. Yeah, or delta i over i is 0 0.10, and now R decreased, um, and decreasing by 5%, 5% is 5 hundredths. Um, so uh, it says it's negative, negative 0 0.05. So that's what you're given. And then, yes, you evaluate those differentials at that delta I and delta R, but the effect of that is what it was before. It's just that the di gets replaced by delta i, and the dr, when you evaluate, gets replaced by delta r. And so you just think this becomes, when you evaluate, that this becomes delta i over i, this becomes delta r over r, and what you get is that this is 2 times 0 0.10 minus 0 0.05, and so you get 0 0.20 minus 0 0.05, so that's 0 0.15. That means that delta P over P is approximately 0.15, so the answer to the question, approximate the relative change in delta P, delta um, P changes I approximately changes, this is goes up because we got a positive number, it goes up by approximately 15%, right? It's, it's nice to phrase these things in terms of percent because in ordinary speech when you say percent, you mean of the original value. So 
P changes by approximately 15 percent. You know, what we really were getting is delta P over P is approximately 0 0.15. Um, you might wonder about the units. I haven't had any in, in the answer. And the answer is, the reason for that is there aren't any. You know, sometimes you shouldn't do algebra with units, but here it's nice because this is in watts, that's in watts, so it's always unitless. In fact, the, the relative differential and the relative change in something always is unitless because the numerator and denominator always have the same value, so it's kind of nice. P changes by approximately 15%, regardless of what P was measured in. All right, that is all of the um, deeper stuff that I wanted to go through in this section. Um, we're done.